Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to finish up our discussion on symmetry and use of character tables. And then we're going to uh, enter into the first part of molecular orbital theory, which is chapter 5. We ended here last time where we were showing the second example of how we can use character tables and symmetry to distinguish between molecules and understand something about um, the number of infrared and, and Raman vibrations that we would expect to see. Okay? And this example between these two isomers, this FAC isomer and this MER isomer. And the idea is that we can make any reducible representation of any set of vectors in the molecules that we care about uh, looking into. In this case, we're looking at carbonyl stretches. And so we're going to be looking at the three carbonyl stretches in each of these, these two different molecules. The first step, as always, is to assign the point group of the molecule that we're talking about. And the point groups are the C3V and the C2V okay, in, these, in these two particular cases. And we went through this first um, isomer last time, but we'll just walk through it again. Okay, so what we do is we look at generating the reducible representation for these three vectors. We have to bring up the C3V character table in order to do this properly. And remember that if the, if the vector is unchanged, we assign it a character of 1. If the vector is changed in any way, we assign it a character of 0. In this particular point group, those are the only two options. Okay? And so we generate our reducible representation for these three CO vectors. Under this, uh, the identity operation, nothing changes, and so we get a character of 3. Under a C3 operation, right, the C3 is coming out at you in this case, we get a character of 0 because all the bonds change. And for one of the reflection planes, the reflection plane is going to cut through one of the CO bonds in each case. And so we're having a character of 1 in this, in this particular uh, symmetry operation. We then take our reducible representation and we reduce it to its irreducible components to determine what the irreducible components are. To do that, sorry about this box here. This is um, something I can't get rid of on my computer at the moment. But we can use our summation rule to do this. It's basically our decomposition equation to get the number of irreducible representations of any given type, which are three possible types in the CQV. We take one over the order and we take the sum over all symmetry operations. The operations in class multiply the character of the reducible representation multiplied by the character of the irreducible representation. And so we can start with A1. For A1, the order here for the C3V is 6. That's the number of symmetry operations present in the point group. We have one symmetry operation per class, so that's just the one here. And then we multiply three times one, plus zero times one, plus one times one, or three times three, sorry. And we get one divided by six, multiplied by six, gives us one overall. So there's one A1 irreducible representation in this reducible representation. And we can just go down the list. We can look at A2. We find that there's none there. There's no A2 present. And that must mean that we have one E present, because the, um, the total number um, under the identity operation must equal 3. It must equal the same number as on our reducible representation here. So we have 1 from the A1, and we have 2 from the E, and that gives us 3 total. So we know that we've got a complete set of irreducible representations that correspond to this particular reducible. So we have, then, gamma equaling 1A1 and 1E. E. And what we can do with this is we can then look at A1 and E and assign whether we're going to have infrared or Raman activity from these different modes. So here's our reducible and our irreducible components. The IR active, remember, you have to have the same symmetry as the X, Y, and Z axis because we have to have the dipole oscillating in order to interact with the electric field. We look at our character table, we can directly read off that A1 has the symmetry of the Z axis and E has the symmetry of the X and Y axis together. So both the A1 and the E are going to be infrared active. So we expect to see two peaks in our spectrum. We look then at Raman activity. And remember, Raman activity is predicted when we have um, the irreducible representation that goes as the quadratics, the binary products of x, y, and z. Okay. So we again look at A1, and it has, um, let's say, z squared symmetry. And we look at E, and it has x, y, it has a bunch of binary product symmetries. And so both of these modes are also going to be Raman active. And so our prediction then is that we expect the facial isomer have two infrared vibrational transitions that we see in the spectrum. 
and two Raman transitions that we see in the spectrum. The question is, does the MER isomer have a different number of infrared and Raman bands that we expect to see? Okay. And on that basis, then, we can distinguish between them just looking at symmetry properties. So that's the FAC isomer. It's C3V. The MER isomer is C2V. Here's the C2V character table. We do exactly the same thing. We look at how these three different vectors transform under the different symmetry operations. We generate a reducible representation for this. We have three under E. The C2 axis is along this axis here. So this is the Z axis of the molecule. C2 with this axis does not change this bond, but changes the other two. And so we just have a character of one. The next one over, the reflection plane, we can consider that plane to be the plane that contains all three of the CO bonds. Okay? And that's going to give a character of three because none of those bonds change under that operation. And finally, the other reflection plane, which is going to be the plane that contains the CO, this chlorine, and this chlorine here, gives us a character of one because these two flip, but this one doesn't change. We have our reducible. We want to reduce it to its irreducible components. We do that with the same approach. And we can just list them out here. We're going to have two A1s. We'll have zero A2s. We'll have zero B1s. And we'll have, oh, sorry, we'll have one B1 and we'll have zero B2s. Again, we have three to total character under identity of three, which better be there because we have a total character in our reducible representation of three under the identity operation. Now we can assign Raman and infrared activity or um, non-activity to these different modes. We have our 2A1 and our B1. We look at IR activity. We see that the A1 and the B1 are both Raman, or, uh, infrared, activity, infrared active. Sorry. And so we expect to see three peaks in this case because we have three different modes. And it's the same thing for Raman activity. Okay? The A1 and the B1 are both Raman active, and so we expect again to see three peaks in this case. So the MER isomer should have three in its infrared and its Raman spectrum. The FAC isomer should only have two in its infrared and its Raman spectrum. And so we can profitably use these symmetry considerations to distinguish between these two molecules okay, quite easily. These are just two examples, right? We looked at all the motion of a D2H molecule, and we looked at a subset of the motion of these two different isomers. You can look at, in principle, any set of vectors in any point group that you want to um, and determine these sorts of, these sorts of answers. Okay? So you could be looking at a subset of the bonds. You could be looking at um, just the translational motion, just the vibrational motion, whatever you'd like. Okay? The procedure is the same. OK, so let's summarize then what we've talked about in chapter four, the last part of chapter four. So group theory tells us a lot, right? So just symmetry considerations alone can tell us a tremendous amount about different molecules. It can tell us what molecules are chiral. Remember, it has to belong to a pure rotational uh, point group to be chiral. Molecules that possess dipole moments that have chemically identical groups and other symmetry-related properties like, like vibrations, okay? assigning vibrations. We can use group theory to determine the vibrational modes of molecules using the following procedure. We start always by determining the point group of the molecule. That sort of sets the landscape for us to, in order to do our calculations, right, our symmetry calculations. We build up a reducible representation for whatever vectors we're interested in. Okay? All motion, just CO bonds, for example, other kinds of vectors are equally fine. We reduce the representation to its irreducible components using our um, reducing equation, right, the summation equation. And then if we want to, we take those and we, those, that information and we answer whatever questions we're interested in. Right? So for example, we might be interested in assigning the modes to different kinds of motion, translation, rotation, vibration. And in principle, by just looking at the kind of symmetry of the vibration, we can understand whether it's a stretch or a bend or different kinds of wags or twists and different, different sorts of molecular vibrations. And if we want to further, we can then assign whether those vibrations are infrared and or Raman active just by looking, glancing at the character table. So that's the power of the character tables, right? It gives us all the symmetry information of the point group right there in a nicely tabulated form that we can just easily reference and um, get a lot of information pretty quickly. Okay? So become very familiar with the basic character tables that are at the back of your book.
work the problems in the back of the chapter, look at the examples in the text. Okay, these are all very helpful things. And then come to office hours and come to discussions and we can uh, try to answer any questions you might have. Okay. In the back, yeah. Why was, sorry? B2 not IR active. So B2 is going to be IR active, but B2 is not one of the irreducible representations that we care about because it's not contained in our reducible representation. So you're right that if you look at B2 here, you have infrared activity because it goes as the y axis, right? Um, in fact, the only mode that's not going to be infrared active is A2, but we neither have A2 nor B2 in our irreducible set. Yep, that's right. All of the modes are going to be Raman active. Yep, that's right. Other questions? Okay, if not, we're going to start now um, our discussions about molecular orbital theory. And we begin with sort of um, the basics, as we would hope, I guess, um, some of the principles of molecular orbital theory. Now, you've seen molecular orbital theory in disguised form. Maybe some of you have actually seen it in full-blown form in physical chemistry, maybe. Um, you definitely have built uh, molecular orbital diagrams in the past for simple molecules, usually uh, homonuclear diatomic species. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce the um, theory, molecular orbital theory itself, and use the theory, especially its connections with symmetry, to build up the molecular orbital picture for um, arbitrary molecules. We'll start with simple molecules, of course, and then we'll build up to multi-atom molecules with different sorts of atoms. And um, finish with things like octahedral complexes, okay, or tetrahedra, molecules with that kind of complexity. So what is molecular orbital theory? Molecular orbital theory is one approach to understanding the electronic structure of molecules. Okay. The, the perspective is basically that we assume that the valence electrons of the molecule are coming about from the valence electrons of the individual atoms within the molecule. Okay, so the atoms interact in some fashion, and the valence electrons are what we are concerned with. We don't concern ourselves with the core electrons, the electrons very deep in energy. But we consider the electrons from the individual atomic orbitals to interact in some way and generate then the molecular orbitals for the entire molecule. And the electrons, in some sense, are going to be delocalized over various parts of the molecule or maybe over the entire molecule. Okay, depending on the particular orbitals that are interacting. We are going to make molecular orbitals by taking linear combinations of the valence orbitals of the individual atoms. So we're going to take atomic orbitals, take linear combinations of those, and we generate molecular orbitals from those. Okay. So we can consider a simple, the simplest example, perhaps, H2. Okay. So what we do with H2, we have just one, one s orbitals that we care about. Right? This is the valence orbital for hydrogen. And a linear combination means that we take either the sum or the difference of these two orbitals in this case. Linear meaning that we're not squaring the orbital, we're not uh, taking the, the cube power of the orbital or anything like this. We're just making a sum of linear terms. Okay? And the two ways we can do that with two 1s orbitals is we can take the two 1s orbitals and add them, or we can take them and subtract them from one another. Okay? So this is the orbital corresponding to hydrogen atom A, and this would be the orbital for hydrogen atom B. The shading, as we'll describe, indicate the sign of the wave function. And it's arbitrary what we choose. We can say that the dark um, uh, orbitals are positive and the white orbitals are negative, okay? something like that. That's fine. When we take the atomic orbitals and we add them together in this fashion, what we get is a molecular orbital that has this sort of flavor to it. Okay? This tells us that we have electron density between the two nuclei. And it's also looking like a sigma type interaction, right? If we remember from um, general chemistry, from organic chemistry, we have sigma, we have pi, and we'll introduce another bonding type called delta. But a sigma type orbital has no node along the internuclear axis, and it has electron density between the two atoms. Okay? If we take the difference Right? We take a positive and we add a negative 1s. Then what we get is another sigma type orbital that we call a sigma star. The star indicates that it's an antibonding orbital, as we'll describe. 
But in this case, because we take the difference and not the, not the sum, we have no electron density between the two nuclei. Okay. Electron density is mostly located away from the internuclear region. Okay. So this is called a bonding orbital, and this is going to be called an antibonding orbital. Okay. We'll go through this very carefully. Now, symmetry is going to allow us to treat molecules of um, quite high complexity. Okay. We're not going to go crazy, but we will be dealing with um, some significant complexity in the molecules that we'll treat by the uh, methods that we develop. Okay, so the most common way to make molecular orbitals is the so-called linear combination of atomic orbitals method. So we're going to do a little uh, basic quantum mechanics here for the simplest example for hydrogen um, and show how this all works, how the machinery actually works. This is not described in depth in your book, at least in chapter five. Um, there's some description of it in the earlier chapters. Okay. So what do I mean by a linear combination of atomic orbitals? What I mean is the following equation here. Okay. Psi refers to the wave function of a molecular orbital. Molecular orbital n. Okay. It's given a subscript to indicate whatever molecular orbital it might be. So the molecular orbital n is equal to the sum of atomic orbitals. So these little guys here are individual atomic orbitals. They could be 1s, they could be 2s, they could be 2p, they could be 3d atomic orbitals. Okay, it depends on the problem. And there's a sum over a certain number of them, usually a finite number of atomic orbitals. Could be 2, that's what we'll start with. And each atomic orbital is weighted by a so-called weighting coefficient, which is given the, the, uh, the label cn. Okay? So this tells us, this is just a number, this is a function. This number here tells us basically how much of the molecular orbital is built from this individual atomic orbital. Okay. Gives us sort of the amount of mixing of the different atomic orbitals in the molecular orbital. Okay. And then so we can just expand our sum over whatever number of atomic orbitals we care about. And usually it's going to be like, let's say, six or less. In order to make molecular orbitals from atomic orbitals, there are three basic considerations, three basic things that need to be satisfied. The first thing is that the atomic orbitals, and this is where we connect with our earlier chapter, right, must have the same symmetry in order to interact to form molecular orbitals. By the same symmetry, we mean very specifically that they must have the same irreducible representation in the point group that we're talking about. Okay, if they do not have the same irreducible representation, then they will not interact to form molecular orbitals. So we have to have the same symmetry. The atomic orbitals must have similar energies in order to interact. So if they have the same energy, it's going to turn out that they will interact to a quite significant extent. If they have very different energies, then the amount of interaction falls off with the energy difference. And after a certain threshold energy, certain kind of loosely defined threshold energy difference, you'll have very, very little to zero interaction between atomic orbitals. Okay. So they have to have the same symmetry, they have to have similar energy. And finally, in order to interact and form molecular orbitals, the atomic orbitals must have spatial overlap. Right. The atoms have to be close enough that they actually can interact with one another. If they're not close enough, then there's not going to be inter any interaction. Okay. And the interaction is going to depend, of course, on the distance in a specific way, depending on the particular orbitals that we're talking about. Okay, so one thing to keep in mind, this is an incredibly powerful concept, molecular orbital theory. It's very widely applied and successful, but it, it's, a, it's an approximation to the reality of the situation. Okay? Any electronic model like this is going to be an approximation. And LCAO MO theory is similar. It's also an approximation to the exact electronic structure of the molecule which is actually quite difficult to calculate. Okay, <clears throat> let's build up the machinery here. So this is where we do a little bit of quantum mechanics. Let's consider the simplest case, two atoms, A and B, okay, each carrying a single atomic orbital that we care about, atomic orbital one and atomic orbital two. Okay, and so I've labeled them here, here's atom A, here's atom B, they're separated by a certain distance. This one's got atomic orbital one, atomic orbital two. We can write molecular orbitals for this situation as a linear combination of these two atomic orbitals. In the following way, we have psi, the molecular orbital wave function, is equal to C1 
times phi, right, plus C2 times phi, 2. So this gives us the weighting coefficient for, for atomic orbital 1, weighting coefficient for atomic orbital 2. What we're interested in doing, in part, is determining what these coefficients are. If we can determine what C1 and C2 are, then we have the full equation for the molecular orbital. Okay? So that's the nature of the problem. And with that, we can then determine the energies and other things, too. We're not going to get into the energies so much. We're just going to qualitatively talk about that. You probably remember from general chemistry, from physical chemistry, if, you, if you've taken it so far, <clears throat> that the wave function is a probability amplitude. Okay? We can interpret it as a probability amplitude. That means that the square, in particular the modulus square, the absolute square of the wave function, gives us a probability density. Okay? The probability per unit volume of finding an electron okay, in this part of the molecule or over the entire molecule or whatever. Okay? And so if we need to square the wave function to get probability density. If we do that with this equation for the molecular orbital wave function, we have to square the whole thing. Okay? And when we square it, we get three terms that look like that. C1 squared, right, molecular orbital 1 squared, the same thing for molecular orbital 2, and then we have a cross term, C1, C2, phi1, phi2. Okay. This is a probability density. If we want to get the probability itself, just a number that tells us the probability of finding an electron in a various part of the molecule, what we have to do is take the integral. Okay. We have to integrate for the entire volume that we care about. So that's what I've done here. All I've done is take the integral of both sides of the equation, so the integral of the molecular orbital wave function over all little spatial um, regions, infinitesimal spatial, spatial regions here, and I've taken the integral of these three terms there. These numbers pop out of the integral because they're just numbers. Right? The functions stay in the integral because those are what we're integrating. Those are the functions. Okay? So we have these three terms now, these three integrals that we need to understand a little bit. Integral number one basically tells us the probability of finding the electron close to atom one, or atom A, sorry. Okay. It looks very much just like the atomic orbital for atom A, right, the probability of finding the electron there. The second term is the same thing for atom B, right, the probability of finding the electron close to atom B. This cross term here depends on the overlap, the product of the two atomic orbitals. This is important between the atoms. Okay? This tells us something about the probability of finding the electron in the space between the atoms. Okay? It's especially large, of course, when the overlap between atomic orbital 1 and 2 is large. That's what this integral is telling us. Okay, okay. so I've just regurgitated that equation here. Right? We've got the probability, probability of finding the electron close to A, to B, and then in some sense, between the two. One thing to remember is that the individual atomic orbitals, the 1s orbitals, the 2p orbitals, whatever, are normalized, individually normalized. And remember what normalization means in quantum mechanics and in general chemistry, right? Normalization means this. You take the integral over all space, it must equal 1. In other words, the probability of finding an electron in atomic orbital A of an isolated atom a is 100%. Okay. We have to find the electrons somewhere in space. So the individual atomic orbitals of the isolated atoms are normalized. Okay. So atomic orbital 1 and 2 are both normalized. Off by themselves, if there's an electron in that orbital, we integrate over all space, the probability of finding the electron must be 1. And so what does that tell us for our equation up here? Well, that means that this integral here is 1. Okay? The second integral here is 1 because the atomic orbitals are individually normalized. This last integral here, though, is not 1 because we have the product of the two separate atomic orbitals. We call this integral here S, big S. This stands for the overlap integral. This is called the overlap integral. It's called that, of course, because it determines the amount of overlap between these two atomic orbitals over all space. So we simplify our equation based on this and this going to 1 and this becoming s. And this is what we have for our probability for our molecular orbital. We have c1 squared, c2 squared, and then our cross term, 2c1, c2, 
multiplied by s, the overlap integral. Okay. Okay, so far so good. Let's take this and finish the job now so that we can actually get the different um, equations for the molecular orbitals. Yeah, question in the back. Yeah, so this integral here, the first integral basically, is the overlap integral of atomic orbital one with itself. Okay, so this is the probability for an isolated atom, atom one, of finding the electron there. Okay, in the molecular orbital it's slightly different, but it's still the probability of finding the electron close to atom A. Okay, this is the probability of finding the electron close to atom B. Okay, in an isolated atom B, it has to equal 100%, right? But in the molecular orbital, of course, you're going to have some sharing of the electron density between the two atoms. So this is just going to be the probability of finding the electron close to B. This is the probability of finding the electron in some sense between the two atoms, okay? In the shared region between the two atomic orbitals. That's very loose qualitative um, thinking, but it's, it's fine for our purposes. Okay, so we've got our equation then for the probability for the molecular orbital that we're talking about, this two atom orbital, two atomic orbital orbital. Okay. Let's simplify our lives here and think about a specific example. Let's just look at an example in which we have identical atomic orbitals on identical atoms. Okay, so A and B, atoms A and B are the same, let's call them hydrogen. And the two atomic orbitals that we care about are both 1s's. Okay, let's make it very simple. In that case, we have the situation in which there's no distinction between the two atoms. And the probability of finding the electron close to A and close to B must be the same. Okay? So what that means is that we have this wave function, this is the molecular orbital wave function, with this condition where the square of C1 and the square of C2 are equal. Why is the square of C1 and the square of C2 equal? Because that is what's corresponding to the probability Okay, of finding the electron near A and near B. Okay. So the probabilities have to be the same for the two atoms because they're identical, the two atomic orbitals are identical. This condition here gives us two solutions to this equation. Right? We have the positive root and we have the negative solution. Okay. So C1 can either be positive C2 or C1 equal C2, right? or C1 can be equal to negative C2. Those are the two possibilities. And those give us two solutions to this molecular orbital equation. We have the sum and we have the difference. Okay? So here's our two molecular orbitals, the sum and the difference. And I've labeled here just psi positive to indicate that it's the positive solution and psi negative to indicate that's the negative solution. These are the positive sum, this is the difference. Okay? And I've given similar notation to the weighting coefficient. Okay. So finally, what we would need to do is normalize the molecular orbital wave function. Okay, the atomic orbital wave functions come in normalized, as long as we use the right ones, the right table in the book, for example. But the molecular orbital wave functions so far are not normalized. We need to normalize them so that just as in an atomic orbital, we have 100% probability of finding the electron somewhere in the orbital if it's occupied. In the molecular orbital, it must be the same thing, right? Somewhere in the molecule, if there's an electron in that orbital, we integrate over all space, the probability of finding it somewhere in space is 100%. So, normalization in this case means that we normalize the molecular orbital wave function, the positive one and the negative one. And you can do this yourself. You can square the wave function for the positive and square the wave function for the negative and determine what the normalization condition must be. What that means is that you go back here and you set this equal to one. Right. This is the integral here over all space. Here's the expansion of the integral. This, all this stuff here must equal 1. And then you can solve for what C has to be. Okay. And if you do that, you get these expressions. Okay. This is C here for the positive solution, and this is C for the negative solution. And these are the full-blown expressions for the molecular orbital wave functions for the positive and the negative solutions. C is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 times 1 plus the overlap integral. In this case, C is equal to 1 over root 2 times 1 minus the overlap integral. So you can see there's a slight difference, positive, negative. 
in the uh, contribution of the overlap integral. Okay. And so we're finished with generating then for this simple picture for uh, two identical orbitals on identical atoms, the molecular orbital wave functions. Okay, so how do we use this? Now let's just continue with our hydrogen example. Okay. We have two identical um, atoms, identical orbitals, one S's. Let's build, um, let's look at those two solutions we just generated and let's build the molecular orbital diagram for hydrogen. Okay. Pretty trivial. To do that, any molecular orbital diagram we draw, we draw an energy axis vertical. And then we usually are going to put one atom on the left and one atom on the right, or a central atom on the left and the rest of the molecule on the right, or some combination of these sorts of ideas. And we're going to see how we generate bonding and anti-bonding molecular orbitals from these individual atomic orbitals. These are the energies, let's just say, of the uh, 1s for A and the 1s for B. They are the same energy, of course. And what happens when they come in and interact is that they generate a molecular orbital for the molecule. So this is the molecule H2 in the center. One of the molecular orbitals is deeper in energy. One of the molecular orbitals is shallower, higher in energy. We can describe, of course, the um, amount of stabilization of this molecular orbital compared to these atomic orbitals. That would be delta E1. Okay. And we can, we can also have the amount of destabilization of the other, the antibonding molecular orbital relative to the atomic orbitals. Okay. The bonding molecular orbital is one of those that we just um, developed. Okay. It's the positive solution, as we've already seen. Okay. And so the positive solution with its coefficient is shown here for psi bonding. We can indicate schematically the bonding orbital for H2 in a couple of different ways. There's the simple just orbital shading approach that's shown here, just showing that we have two 1s orbitals coming in with the same polarity, the same sign. Okay. Not giving a lot of um, credence to the actual shape of the molecular orbital. Okay. It's very just abstract kind of approach. Or what we can do is we can uh, describe the molecular orbital as a real calculation. Okay, so this here is the electron, um, this is the wave function here of the molecular orbital okay, that's calculated using a software package. Okay. And what it gives you, of course, is more accuracy, more um, reality of what the molecular orbital is going to look like. And you can see that you have electron density that's going to be um, between those two atoms. Right? It looks like a sigma type of interaction. So if this is the bonding orbital, then the difference orbital must be the antibonding orbital. That's the one up high. We again have our full molecular orbital wave function. We have the simple just shading diagram, positive and negative, 1s is coming together. And we have our more accurate um, actual calculation of the wave function. In this case, you know, it's blue and red to indicate the different polarity okay, of the wave function. The critical thing here, of course, is that you don't have any electron density between the, directly between the two atoms. Okay? And that's going to cause this particular molecular orbital to be destabilized relative to the atomic orbitals because you've got the two nuclei that are facing each other now, right? the two positively charged species that are pretty close. Down here, the two positively charged species are somewhat mediated by having the electrons spend a lot of time between the two atoms. Okay? And so that's a stabilization of the electrostatics for the, for the molecule. Okay, so we've generated from the beginning, from the basics, LCAO, we've generated the molecular orbital picture for the simplest molecule we can think of, right, hydrogen. Okay. Um, one thing to, to uh, remember, and that I'll show in a, in a little bit, is that the amount of destabilization of the antibonding orbital is larger than the amount of stabilization of the bonding orbital. In other words, delta E2, this distance here, is always bigger than this distance here, the stabilization for the, the bonding molecular orbital. That's because of the different signs that go into the overlap integral. Okay. Turns out that the energy depends partly on the overlap integral. And the energy here is going to be um, divided by 1 plus s. The energy of the antibonding orbital is divided by 1 minus s. And so the antibonding orbital difference is larger than the bonding orbital difference. Okay. All right. We'll come back to that. Of course, we can then fill in the electrons. This would be the, one of the last steps for any molecular orbital um, construction. We have one valence electron from each atom. 
They're both going to pair up in the lowest bonding orbital here and form a molecule with a bond order of one. Right. So pretty straightforward. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail and then we gotta move a little bit more quickly here. Here's the positive, the sum combination of the two molecular, or the two atomic orbitals. Here's atomic orbital one and two, just in a slightly different uh, notation. This we can think of as an in-phase combination. It's gonna generate constructive interference between the two atoms. So you get uh, uh, electron density that's going to look like this, okay, with a constructive interference term. We have large electron density between the two atoms, so that gives us a bonding interaction. And this is gonna lower the, um, the uh, energy of the overall molecule. This is the anti-bonding version here. We have an out-of-phase combination with destructive interference where the probability between the two uh, uh, atoms is lower than it is in this particular case. Right? Well, very small electron density between the two atoms. In fact, in this particular case, there's a nodal plane between the two atoms. Okay? A nodal plane is where the wave function passes through zero, and that nodal plane is right here. Okay? An electron in this orbital is going to raise the, the uh, energy of the molecule. Okay. Just to cement those points. Okay, so I already mentioned a little bit about molecular orbital notation. We're going to be using a lot of just basic um, shading diagrams in all of the following lectures on chapter five. So just so you know, right, we can shade it either way. These two ways of shading are equivalent, right? They can both be positive, they can both be negative. It doesn't really matter which one we choose. And the same thing for the antibonding, it could be this combination, that combination, it's equivalent in this case. The, the shading indicates the sign of the atomic orbital, as I mentioned. The size of the atomic orbital indicates the amount of that atomic orbital in the molecular orbital. So if you have you know, this being much larger than this guy, that means that the contribution from atom A is much larger than the contribution from atom B. So we'll see cases where we do not have some uh, identical atoms where we have um, a large portion of the molecular orbital being um, accounted for by one of the atoms rather than uh, other parts of the molecule. And that will be represented by differences in size. Okay. okay, let's go through some of the basic rules of molecular orbital theory now. There's like five or six rules that I want to make sure that everybody understands. This is rule number one, and this is just a regurgitation of our simple hydrogen picture. Okay. The interaction of n atomic orbitals always gives us n molecular orbitals. Okay, so the orbitals are conserved. We don't destroy or create orbitals. Okay. So that means in this case, if we have two molecular orbitals or two atomic orbitals, then we have one molecular orbital that's going to be bonding. We have one that's going to be antibonding if there's an interaction between them. Okay. The bonding orbital, this one, is always going to be lower than the lowest of the atomic orbitals. And the antibonding orbital, this one, is always going to be higher than the highest of these atomic orbitals. In this case, the two atomic orbitals are degenerate, so it's not that important. But you're always going to have the molecular orbital that's bonding lower than either of the atomic orbitals. You're always going to have the antibonding molecular orbital higher than either of the atomic orbitals. Okay. All right. So a little bit about bond order. We remember what the bond order is. We can uh, describe bond order as one half the number of bonding electrons minus the number of antibonding electrons. So in hydrogen, for example, we have a bond order of one because we have two bonding electrons. We have no antibonding electrons. So we have two divided by two gives us a bond order of one, which gives us a stable molecule. For dihelium, if we were going to consider dihelium, we have two electrons in the 1s from each of the helium atoms coming in to give us you know, four electrons total, two go into the bonding, two go into the antibonding. And we have a bond order in this case of zero because we have two bonding, we have two antibonding, that gives us zero. That's going to give us an unstable molecule okay, in this simplified picture. We do not expect dihelium to ever form okay, because there's no bond that can form between them. Okay, rule number two of molecular orbital theory, if the atomic orbitals are degenerate, then the interaction between them and the amount of uh, bonding and antibonding that you get okay, is going to be proportional to their overlap integral, S. Right? S is always the overlap integral. So if we have two degenerate orbitals, we have um, the orbitals very close together, let's say, where they have a large overlap, then there's going to be a deep bonding and a very shallow antibonding orbital form. If they have less overlap because maybe they're farther away, okay, then you're gonna have less of a bonding and less of an antibonding change in the energy. 
And in the limit of the two atomic orbitals being infinitely far apart, you have zero overlap, and so they just have the same energy that they started out with. So the greater the degree of overlap, the stronger the bonding and the antibonding we expect. This translates into sigma bonds in general giving us you know, bigger splitting than pi bonds, and pi bonds giving us a bigger splitting than delta bonds because the amount of overlap is progressively smaller as we go from sigma to pi to delta in general. Okay, rule number three. Orbitals must have the same symmetry in order to form molecular orbitals. So the atomic orbitals must have the same symmetry in the point group that we're talking about to form molecular orbitals. And one way to think about that is that we have to have the same irreducible representations in order to have a finite or non-zero overlap integral. Okay? Otherwise, the overlap integral is going to be zero. So here's our overlap integral again. Remember that it's the product of the two atomic orbitals we're talking about integrated over all space. Okay. We're going to have S rigorously equal to zero okay, if the two atomic orbitals have different irreducible representations. If they don't have the same symmetry, then S is equal to zero and there's no interaction between them. No bonding and no antibonding orbitals will form. If S is not equal to zero, Okay, if there is overlap, then we're going to have bonding and antibonding combinations. Right? There will be interactions. Okay, so that's just restated here what I already said. Okay. If an orbital has S is equal to zero with every other orbital within the molecule, then we have something called a non-bonding orbital. Right? So we can have bonding, we can have antibonding, and we can have non-bonding. And in a complex molecule, there's going to be complex mixtures of these three possibilities. So we'll have some bonds that are mostly non-bonding, you might describe them. You'll have, so, uh, you'll have some uh, orbitals that are, you know, pretty strongly bonding and so forth. This is the kind of qualitative language that we're going to have to use when we get to more complex molecules. For simple molecules with just two atoms, it's very clear. You have bonding and you have antibonding combinations. Okay. okay. So let's look at the overlap integrals as a function of bond type. Okay. What kind of overlap do we expect to see? What cases do we expect to have the possibility of overlap? And in what cases by symmetry can we have no overlap happen? Okay. So the bonding nature of the orbital interaction is defined by the orbital phasing or the sign of the, of the atomic orbitals, right? We have bonding when they're in phase, we have antibonding when they're out of phase. Okay. And that's again telling us amount, about the amount of electron density between or, or not between the two atoms. The type of bond is defined by, one way to think of it, is defined by the number of nodes that run along the internuclear axis. So a sigma type bond or a sigma antibond, right, have no nodes that run along the internuclear axis. So this particular combination here, let's say that these are two PZ orbitals coming in and interacting with each other, would be called a sigma bond. We could have an antibond, a sigma antibond, by just taking the negative of this one and, and um, putting them together, right? So we would have negative positive, negative positive. That would be an antibond, but it would be a sigma type antibond. Okay? No uh, node along the internuclear axis. We can also generate sigma and sigma star bonds, right? Sigma and sigma star interactions with the, the uh, dz squared orbital, right? And there are other possibilities too, okay? as we'll show. Pi type interactions have one node along the internuclear axis. That's the easiest way to identify them. So the node along the internuclear axis is right here, coming out at you. It's a plane. Okay? Where the wave function changes sign, it goes through zero. Okay? This type of interaction might be Px, Px. When they come together, we're going to make pi and we can make pi star kinds of interactions. Okay? So here's an example of a pi where we have the, let's say, the, the negative and the positive coming together. Here's an example of a pi star with d orbitals, okay, where we have positive negative, po negative positive coming together. Okay. Again, it's a pi interaction because we have a node along the internuclear axis right here, okay, where the wave function goes through zero. And finally, delta bonds, okay, this is baby Greek delta here. Delta bonds are those that have two nodes along the internuclear axis. In this case, a node that runs out at you and then one 90 degrees rotated in the plane. Okay. So the wave function changes sign when it goes through both of those planes. Okay. 
It's a delta interaction. This is a generally weaker interaction because typically it occurs when you have cofacial d orbitals. Okay? So this d orbital is on atom A, this is on atom B, and they're facing each other. So the amount of overlap here is smaller in general than it is for a pi interaction, which is then smaller than it is for a sigma interaction. So d, orbit d orbitals are particularly um, prone, possible, for making uh, delta interactions. And we can have delta, and we can have delta star. Okay, remember the star is always telling us it's an anti-bond configuration. Okay, so these are all the po some possibilities here of actually making um, in, uh, positive interactions that have you know, non-zero overlap. There are some situations in which we're going to have rigorously zero overlap just by symmetry considerations alone. So here's a couple of examples here of interactions that have zero overlap by symmetry. If you have an s orbital and let's say a px orbital like this, and you try to interact them, what you find is that you get negative interaction here offset perfectly by positive interaction here. And when you do the integral over all space, you'll find that the integral is equal to zero. Right? The negatives and the positives cancel out and you get zero interaction. So you cannot form a molecular orbital bonding and antibonding combination by interacting these two orbitals in that fashion. It's perfect cancellation. Same thing is going on here. This is uh, the dz squared, okay? just oriented slightly different than it does up here. Here's a pz orbital right, with the same set of axes. Bring these together and what you find is you get a positive interaction here and you get a negative equal and opposite interaction on the bottom. Perfect cancellation of those two orbitals. They are. These are. That would be an anti-bond, but I'll get to that one last. I skipped that one, right? I'm, I'll come back to that one and finish it. So this is, I hope everybody can see, another example where by symmetry we have zero overlap. Okay? And there are many possibilities like this. If you did the symmetry analysis, you'd find that those two orbitals in whatever point group you might be talking about have different irreducible representations. Okay? What about this combination here? I indicate that that's a sigma interaction. Right, that should actually be written sigma star interaction. This is a p, uh, sorry, an s orbital and a dz squared orbital pointed right at the s. If you just switch the polarity of the dz squared orbital so that this and this were positive and the ring was negative, then you'd see you have a, a nice sigma interaction. This is just a sigma star. Okay. So again, there's no node along the internuclear axis, and um, yeah, you can have in this case, bonding and antibonding combinations with this geometry. Okay, a few more examples, okay? So we can understand the extent of overlap, the, the size of S, right? Because it's gonna depend on the internuclear separation, which is pretty obvious. The, the closer the atoms are, the larger S is going to be. The nature of the orbitals involved and their orientations when the orbitals have um, some dimensionality to them, when they point in a certain direction, for example. If you have s orbitals, two s orbitals that are spherically symmetric, right? It doesn't matter where they are located relative to one another. It just depends on their distance. If the, if the orbitals are directly on top of one another, then you have perfect over orbital overlap, and you have s is equal to 1. The two orbitals are identical. Okay? As you move them farther and farther apart, the scale is in picometers here. You can see that the amount of overlap decays and then eventually gets very, very small and goes close to 0. Let's consider the case of parallel 2p orbitals that are just going to be displaced along the axis, okay, that's perpendicular to the orbitals. When they're right on top of one another, perfectly on top of one another, the overlap is perfect. It's 100%. It's 1. Okay. As you move them apart from one another, they fall off in a, in a functional form that looks very similar to the s orbital fall off. Okay. Kind of this sigmoidal shape with an exponential fall off in the end. Okay. What about perpendicular 2p's? a p that's oriented this way and a p that's oriented that way. They have zero overlap for all uh, distances. When they're directly on one another, you can see that you've got perfect cancellation. And when you pull them apart from one another, this lobe has equal and opposite interactions with those two. This lobe has equal and opposite interactions with those two. And you get zero. Here's just another indication of that same thing written for uh, another set of p orbitals. Okay, so we're going to end here. Next time we'll pick up um, and finish the intro rules for molecular orbitals and then talk about diatomic molecules.